Okay, it looks like Facebook Live is all set up. Um, thank you everyone for waiting so patiently. Um, I will just introduce Sarah and we will go ahead and get started. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Okay. Um, Sarah Prager is the author of Queer There and Everywhere, 23 People Who Changed the World, which we have on the shelf right now. Um, you can request it through our curbside service. Um, it's also available on Hoopla for instant download um, as an ebook. Um, this young adult book has received numerous distinctions, including three star reviews and being named a 2017 best book for teens by the New York Public Library. We also like it very much at the Wilmington Memorial Library. Her second book, Rainbow Revolutionaries, 50 LGBTQ plus people who made history has just been released this past month. So it's been out for a few weeks now um, from HarperCollins for ages eight to 12. Sarah has presented on LGBTQ plus history to dozens of audience ac audiences across five countries, including the US Embassy in Mexico City. Her writing has appeared in the Atlantic, HuffPost, The Advocate, and elsewhere. She lives in Massachusetts with her wife and their two young children. Learn more at www.sarahprager.com and follow her on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you so much, Sarah. We are ready for you, you to- Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here or, you know, online with you all tonight. Um, I, I live in Sturbridge, which is a bit a ways from Wilmington, but um, yeah, I am going to be sharing some of the cool stories from my books tonight in honor of Pride Month. Uh, and I'm just gonna start sharing my screen so you can see some images that go along with that. Um, can you still see me too? And my screen too? Um, if someone in our Q&A would, wouldn't mind answering Sarah's question. Um, because everything looks okay on my end. I just want to make sure. Yes, my sister is saying it's looking good. Thank you, Megan. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so um, LGBTQ plus history, my favorite topic in the entire world. Uh, and I will tell you why in a moment. Um, first, I would love it if you all would start putting into the chat or the Facebook comments, um, an intro if you would like, totally optional. Uh, you could say your town or your grade or anything you'd like to just say hello since it's so weird to just talk to a quiet screen. Um, and I would love to know who I am talking with. Um, this is me when I had long hair last year. Um, I live with my wife, Liz, who is a physical therapist. And we have an almost four-year-old and an almost one-year-old. And that little baby is going to be one next month. Um, and her middle name is June in honor of Pride Month. Um, and yeah, we, I grew up in Connecticut. I came out at the age of 14 as lesbian, which is how I still identify. And uh, I didn't know, I didn't have a great sense of a queer community uh, at that age. And teaching myself queer history through high school is what gave me that sense of community because I could connect with the people I was learning about in books and online and seeing a piece of myself in them and knowing I wasn't alone and I wasn't the first person to ever feel this way, far from it. Um, there were just so many people that I could relate to and that um, let me know that I had these ancestors who had cared so much about me in the future that they had sacrifice so much in their activism for the future that I'm now living um, more safely and openly than they ever could have imagined. And uh, 
it, it gave me so much. Um, and it, it developed my sense of identity and um, let me see what was possible because those heroes achieved such incredible things and it helped me to see that I could do something like that too. Um, so that's why I care so deeply about queer history and sharing it, especially with young people. Uh, I have done a bunch to try to help share our wonderful history with people, first through my mobile app called Quist, um, and then through my two books, um, as you heard in my introduction, um, for teens and for middle grade. And um, the books share the stories of specific people. And they do, I share history through people's stories. I, because I mean, how else can you? It is made up of these people and uh, their stories are what we can connect with, what we can learn from. And so I'm gonna be sharing some of their stories with you tonight. Um, some of the 23 people who were featured in Queer There and Everywhere are also featured in um, the 50 people in Rainbow Revolutionaries, but there are many new people, of course. Um, so you have heard me use the word queer already. Um, it's a somewhat controversial word, especially generation to generation, because uh, it was primarily or was exclusively a slur, um, a, a hateful word used against LGBTQ people as an insult. And um, people, especially of older generations, feel that, um, often will feel that very viscerally. And um, the younger generations have reclaimed this word uh, and taken it back and call themselves that. And so it's become um, today an umbrella term in many senses. You can individually identify as queer, but you can also use the word queer to talk about many people, um, many different identities under one term. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to be using queer to mean anyone not straight in any way or not cisgender, which is the opposite of transgender in any way, according to our, the, the norms of our time and place or their time and place. Uh, it can be really complicated when we talk about language uh, when it comes to history because the word transgender has only been around since the 1970s, but trans history goes back a lot further than that. And historians debate, can we call somebody trans if they never self-identified that way? And the concept as we know it didn't exist in their time and place. Um, that's part of why I just use this general umbrella term queer to say, no matter what term was used or would have been used, I'm just gonna say queer to indicate something not straight going on or something um, potentially in the trans umbrella going on. So um, another disclaimer is that we, in talking, this is gonna be a generally uplifting time together, but uh, these, these people being from the past have all passed away. Um, sometimes not in pleasant ways. Uh, they all experience discrimination. Um, we're gonna be talking about riots, uh, rising up against um, a police force. So um, if any of this is triggering for you, feel free to step away or mute for that part or um, just be aware and do what you need to do. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little more about queer history in general, and then I'm gonna share some really cool stories. And then we'll have time to chat. And thank you, Jenny, for 
your introduction if anybody else wants to put theirs into the chat. I'm still accepting those throughout. All right. So question one, what do you already know about queer history? If I say queer history, does any person or group of people or event come to mind? Um, or maybe a concept or a feeling? Um, what comes to mind when I say queer history? Maybe a, an era, any of that a specific person? Osh? Can you um, elaborate, Grace? Uh, Harvey Milk, Marsha P. Johnson. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, a two-spirit person. Okay. Yes, I've heard of them. Thank you, Grace. What a wonderful contribution. The ancient Greeks, San Francisco, Alan Turing. Actually, we're, Alan is one of the six stories I'm gonna be sharing. That's awesome, thank you. Those are wonderful responses. Um, <laughs> so, what comes to mind first for a lot of folks is Stonewall. Have you ever heard of Stonewall? Yes, one yes. Anyone else, yes or no? Okay. So this, uh, how about a follow-up question? Do you know when the Stonewall riots took place? Maybe a month and year or even a full date. Um, start putting your guesses in. Okay, so um, Stonewall Inn, is a queer bar still in operation today, currently closed, um, but hopefully reopening as everything reopens. Um, Grace is correct, 1969. Uh, does anyone know a month? Um, so in 1969, New York City, being queer was illegal in just about every possible way. Um, Dancing with someone of the same sex was illegal. Serving alcohol to a group of queer people was illegal. Wearing clothing of the opposite sex, cross-dressing was illegal. Um, it was legal to discriminate in housing, employment, et cetera, um, based on sexual orientation and gender identity. There were no protections. And so, a queer bar was a completely criminal establishment and the police would raid it regularly again and again and take everybody away in paddy wagons to jail. Uh, it was relentless and it ruined people's lives. Um, these arrests that became public and caused them to lose their jobs and more. Uh, one night in on June 28, 1969, the people who were at the bar fought back against a police raid and refused to be arrested. And this started um, a riot that kind of started the whole queer rights movement of the last 50 years. There had been years of protests, even riots, 
organizing, picketing, et cetera, in the 50s and 60s in the US. Um, the first queer rights organization in the US was founded in the 20s in Chicago. But um, this night, was something sparked all of it. There was organizing in the summer following the founding of major organizations and um, it, it grew into a multi-night event. Um, and we celebrate Pride in June every year be, as celebrating the anniversary of the Stonewall riots because it changed so much for our movement, fighting back. And um, so the first Pride was in 1970. Uh, celebrating the first anniversary of the 1969 riots. So this year is the 50th Pride, uh, although it's going to look very, it, it looks very different this year. Um, the Stonewall riots were led by trans women of color and especially one named Marsha P. Johnson, a black woman, uh, as was mentioned in the comments already. And so the LGBTQ plus rights movement owes so much um, to, to her and those communities. Um, yeah, so this was such an important event that I have to start with talking about it because LGBTQ plus history is talked about in pre-Stonewall and post-Stonewall. That's how important this was. So how far back pre-Stonewall does queer history go? I mentioned some organizing in the 50s, the 20s, somebody mentioned the ancient Greeks already. Um, does it go back earlier than the ancient Greeks? What's the earliest kind of thing you can think of? So you might be typing this in, um, but I'll kind of give it to you. No answers. So all time, all of human history, as you might have guessed, uh, their queerness has been around in some shape and form forever, um, as long as people have been, or animals <laughs> with same-sex attraction and intersex animals. There's um, even pre-human, I guess. Uh, Although I guess we don't have evidence, but anyway, talking about human history here. Uh, some of the ways we know that, somebody already men mentioned Oshtish. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly how you pronounce it, but um, this picture of three people here is um, of two spirit people in Chile. And two spirit people uh, are Native American people. And the, the term comes from, um, spirits of male and female existing in one person. And um, two spirit people, there's evidence of them existing in almost all, just dozens and dozens of tribes from Canada to Argentina, all through the Americas. And um, it's a term that refers to Native Americans, but uh, transness, in that way exist, existed in so much of the pre-colonial world. Um, and an important thing about two-spirit people, and that is a modern umbrella term as well, referring to many types of third and fourth and fifth genders in many, many different tribes, uh, is that in almost all these places and communities, Two-spirit people were honored and revered for having a special gift. They were not just tolerated um, or accepted, but they were leaders and healers um, in, in their communities. And so it was obviously very different once um, white Christian European men arrived. And um, but the, the history does go back um, that far before the founding of, of the United States. Uh, 
the other image here is of a Hindu deity that is presenting as half male, half female. And that's one of the ways that we know that the concept of male and female existing within one person goes back even before the written word because um, these deities and origin stories in more than just Hinduism around the world uh, goes back in imagery even further. So there are statues of um, this and other deities, for example, that date back thousands of years. So um, it goes back very, very far. And the idea of there being just male and female as the only two ways to be, or heterosexuality even being the norm um, is a colonial um, export and imposed on the world. Uh, bisexuality was common and accepted and in some places the norm above heterosexuality um, in pre-colonial times and not everywhere, um, but the the um, impact of colonialism on queerness cannot really be overstated. Um, the majority of countries that outlaw queerness today have those laws on the books from when they were a British colony. Um, even though the UK has updated its laws now, um, when they colonized those places, that's the law that stuck. So, um, all right, and this is gonna bring us in to our six stories of individual people. What do the high five and the computer have in common? And I will, while you're typing in your answer and thinking, I will give you one answer that I got at a library in Connecticut that was awesome, um, digital connection. like digits connected. Uh, <laughs> so not the answer I was looking for, but like the best answer. Right, yes, Plato too. Um, so any guesses about the high five in the computer besides digital connection? Did I stump you? All right. Well, the answer is they were both invented by gay guys. Hmm. Yeah. Who even thinks of the high five as having an inventor? But we're going to learn about the inventor of the computer, Alan Turing, and the inventor of the high five, Glenn Burke. So Alan Turing, who was mentioned in the comments at the beginning, um, you might have seen the biopic about him uh, where Benedict Cumberbatch plays him in The Imitation Game, a 2014 movie. Um, he invented the computer. He was already working in the UK where he was from on theoretical computer science before World War II. But when the war broke out, um, the government, the British government called on him to work in code breaking and he created what he called a universal machine that could compute anything uh, in order to break the secret code that the Nazis were using to communicate between each other. And he succeeded in this um, with a team and that um, being able to decode the Nazi messages helped to shorten the war and ensure the Allies' victory. So um, as if the computer was not a big enough invention to change the world, it impacted um, a world war. And so this was a major invention, of course. 
but it was all top secret and he um, was never able to talk about it um, the rest of his life. Uh, it was just declassified um, in our lifetime. So he uh, unfortunately was also gay. He actually called the police to report a burglary. And when they found out the last person to be at his home had been a guy, they arrested him and they dropped the burglary investigation and went after him um, for being with this guy. And uh, they gave him a choice after he was convicted of homosexuality of either two years in prison or something that is called chemical castration, uh, which is the forced, um, forced injections of estrogen. And that was supposed to cure his homosexuality. Um, you know, it was illegal to be gay in um, 1950s England, just like it was in 1950s US. And um, he chose the estrogen so that he could stay out of jail and hopefully still work. But as a convicted criminal, um, again, his only crime being being gay, uh, he lost his security clearance um, and his job. And his, he didn't live much longer. You can see 1952, 1954. Uh, and it's debated whether his death was accidental or suicide. And that's as dark as we're going to get tonight because that's, his story is extremely sad because just not only did he deserve to live out his life, but imagine what else he could have given the world over decades more of this brilliant mind at work um, for all of us. And I, I share this upsetting story because it helps to illustrate why we work against homophobia. Um, not only, uh, uh, we don't need more of a reason than gay people deserving to live full lives, but it helps all people, um, including straight people, when we have the, all of our minds and ideas at the table, everybody's work and is valued. And when somebody like Alan can be him his full self and continue working um, and inventing and creating, it, it helps the whole world. And, you know, his work was picked up by a woman named Lynn Conway who was working at IBM in the 1960s here in the US. And she ended up being on the team that invented these microprocessors that are in all smartphones and computers and everything today. And the difference that just a couple decades of activism makes is that while Lynn was fired, legally fired by IBM for transitioning from male to female, she has, is not only alive, but um, has a successful career in tech today. So that's the difference that it makes and why we need to work against transphobia and all of this because people like Lynn Conway should be advancing everything for everyone, not only being allowed her career, the most important part, but um, if I just find it um, another argument for full inclusion. Um, Glenn Burke, California guy who played for Major League Baseball in the 70s, co-invented the high five when he was, um, you know, with a teammate as he was coming around home plate. And it first became a Dodgers thing. They were trademarking the high five, selling high five t-shirts. And then it became a baseball thing and then a sports thing and then an everywhere thing. Um, and he came out on the Today Show in 1982, which is just very early, um, you know, before Ellen DeGeneres or anybody else um, was having a public coming out, he was. And uh, yeah, um, 
Kleinberg, inventor of the high five. And these are the illustrations of Alan and Glenn. Both of these guys are in both of my books. Um, and these are the Rainbow Revolutionaries, the new, more heavily illustrated one. That's the universal machine that um, did the decoding of the Enigma code um, behind Alan. All right, story three of six is Christina of Sweden who gave up the throne at the age of 26 uh, because they, a requirement of being queen was to marry a man and they did not want to marry a man. They really, really, really didn't. Um, so much so that they gave up all of the power and rode off to live in Rome and lived a full happy life um, in sunny Italy. And uh, they were, they would dress as male and as female. They would date men and women. They were possibly a romantic or asexual or biromantic or bisexual. Um, they were possibly trans, possibly non-binary, possibly agender. It's really hard to say. Um, lesbians also cr claim Christina as um, you know someone um, potentially female identified who refused to marry a man. Um, trans men claim Christina. Uh, there's, um, Christina was possibly intersex as well. Um, the nurse first announced that a prince had been born and then quickly changed their mind and said that it was a princess. Um, so if there was any ambiguity there, um, possibly they were intersex. So um, there's so much queerness that is so hard to label in this person but I think it's great when like multiple so many people can see themselves reflected in a person um, and connect with them and I think a lot of people can also connect with anyone who just wants to bravely give up everything to live authentically and do what they want to do no matter what um, so I love Christina and um, I, that's another person in both books. Alan Hart is just in Rainbow Revolutionaries and is a really timely story because, um, he helped flatten the curve of an infectious disease a hundred years ago. That was the leading cause of death in the United States, tuberculosis. He figured out using new cutting edge x-ray technology, which wasn't even invented when he was born, um, to be able to find TB in the lungs. And with that early detection, they saved thousands of lives. Um, he was not just a medical pioneer um, professionally, but also personally, because with his hysterectomy, he was one of the first people to ever get a gender affirmation surgery in the US. Um, he started taking testosterone um, as soon as synthetic hormones became available in the 1940s. And so he's just one of the first people to physically transition in our country. Um, and so a, a pioneer, very cool spectacles and pipe look there um and this is what he did to the curve on tv which um caused millions of deaths in the u.s before his advancement and his confidence and safety with being able to lower his voice with testosterone is part of why doctors were when he went on a speaking tour to tell doctors about his discovery um, and let them know to start using x-ray is part of why this was possible. So, um, you know, access to being able to physically transition is um, so important for so many reasons. But uh, so here's Christina 
and Alan, Alan number two. And I love what the illustrator Sarah Papworth did um, with all of these illustrations. There's little details to look for everywhere, like the crowns on Christina's, the lettering of Christina's name, and then how Alan's name is written in bones for x-rays. Uh, and every story also, it, you know, this book is set up that each of the 50 people has um, a full page portrait on the left and then the right page um, is a one page bio. And that bio also has an illustrated border that has a bunch of little symbols in it too. All right, our last pair is Juana Inés de la Cruz, who lived in Mexico City uh, in the same time that Cristina was living in Europe. And all she wanted to do was study and go to school, which was not allowed for women in her time and place. Um, she did not want to marry a man either, but she was not royalty. Um, she was a peasant. And so she didn't have the same options uh, as Christina. And, but she found a way to not marry a man either. And so she became a nun. Uh, and that was her way to be able to be taken care of without a husband. Um, she used her time at the monastery to uh, study and became extremely educated and one of the most prolific poets of the Spanish language of all time. And her poems included uh, love poems to her benefactor's wife. Um, so that is Juana. And then finally, Bayard Rustin, a really important activist of the civil rights movement. Um, he was sitting on the front of the bus in protest years before Rosa Parks. Um, as a freedom rider. He studied under Mahatma Gandhi in India and learned about nonviolence, brought that idea back and convinced the leaders of the US civil rights movement to use nonviolence as their primary tactic. Um, the NAACP and others thought it was, could appear weak and he convinced Martin Luther King Jr. and others to use nonviolence. Uh, he was the organizer of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which is where the I Have a Dream speech, um, speech was delivered. Uh, if you watch it, he's right there, standing right behind Martin. And he was also um, the person, at the speaker to deliver the demands of the march. Uh, he also kept this march peaceful peaceful, which was a quarter of a million people with police and racial tensions high. And uh, he put in so much work ahead of time in training the police who would be working crowd control on de-escalation tactics and things like that to make sure it stayed peaceful um, and he achieved it. Um, the arrest in 1953 is, um, for homosexuality, illegal. Um, and so that criminal record kind of kept him in the background of the movement. He could never kind of be a front spokesperson like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so he had to stay in a, a behind the scenes advisor. And uh, he worked for queer rights later in his life as well um, with his partner, Walter, and Walter accepted the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama uh, on Bayard's behalf um, when Bayard was awarded that medal um, after his death. And here are Juana and Bayard's portraits in Rainbow Revolutionaries. So did you feel connected with any of these people. Maybe you wanna be a doctor or an athlete or an activist. Um, maybe you like STEM. Um, or do you just wanna ride off on a horse and give up all responsibility and do whatever you wanna do on the Mediterranean coast? Um, maybe it's 
a identity connection, let me know in the chat if you felt drawn to any of these people's stories because you could kind of see yourself there a bit. I know for me, I kind of like wish I could be like a Christina who, by the way, negotiated, ended a whole European war first, brought peace, then negotiated their exit so that they would have money and servants and stuff for life before they gave up the throne. So, cause they were a really great politician um, and extremely educated like Juana. I think they would have loved each other. Okay, someone connects with Juana. Um, I know a lot of these um, comments are going to all panelists, but if you want everyone to be able to see it, you can send it to all panelists and attendees. Christina has by pride. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, Christina wrote as well, for sure, and their memoirs are published, um, as well as Juana's poetry. Um, you can read what both of those people wrote. Yeah. Alan, yeah, we have to specify which Alan. Um, so someone said Christina and Alan the doctor, which is, um, I mean, it's amazing that almost no one has heard of Alan Hart. Um, he really, he saved thousands of lives. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, we haven't heard of most of these people. I mean, Alan Turing is probably the best known of these. Um, but, you know, Bayard Rustin was a major part of the civil rights movement. And so many people have never heard his name. Um, cool. Thank you for sharing. Uh, oh, and Alan L. Hart, because although I'm a cis woman, I was thinking about the command of his tone as a man. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So having a a male, a more male voice allowed him to be listened to. Yeah. Um, Alan Hart, the doctor, um, experienced a lot of transphobia in his career. So he would show up attempting to pass as a man and someone would find out um, eventually that he had started medical school presenting as female and with a different name. And once this was discovered, he would have to pick up and leave. And he was actually a writer as well. He's a novelist and uh, worked on, uh, uh, used that to supplement his income because he kept losing medical jobs um, and just moving to another state and then another state and ended up living here in New England, um, settled at Yale with his wife. All right. So those are my six stories and my queer history background. Um, I would love to have any discussion, answer any questions. And um, yeah, talk about, uh, hear any more reactions to these stories. Uh, webinar attendees, if you just want to put your questions in the Q&A um, box, I can read them for Sarah. Um, Sarah, maybe while our attendees are typing, um, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about your app? Yeah. Um, um, so Quist is... It's free. Um, it's available for Apple devices right now. Um, we're offline for on the Google Play Store. Um, that's a funding issue. We need to make a required update, um, but we don't have the funding to get back online there. So 
it shows you today in LGBTQ history events. So um, it's, you know, for June, what is today? 16th. You would see like June 16th, 1781, this law is passed or some, you know, and most days have more than one event. So it'd also be like June 16th, 2002, you know, the Friends episode with the lesbian wedding airs or something. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, 2000. I, I don't know what year that was, but, uh, you know, things like that. So it's been downloaded in over 100 countries and its heyday was, you know, its early years um, in the mid 2000 teens. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, it still is online, but it's just not actively being updated anymore um, because of a lack of funding. Hmm. That, I, oh, I wish we could help you with your funding. Um. <laughs> yeah. um, I still try sometimes um, to apply for some, um, but it's really, uh, there's so many other causes to give to that, um, yeah, we could try a crowdfunding. I mean, right now it stays online because of our monthly donors. You can give as little as $1 a month on our Patreon. Uh, and the monthly donations cover the monthly hosting fee to keep it online at all. So um, we do have that funding keeping us online. Um, and we just need one a one-time $1,000 to get back on for Android devices. Oh. Yeah. Let's see if we have any questions. Or comments. Yes. Attendees, don't be shy. Um, well, another question for Sarah. Um, which, um, which person in either of your books uh, was your favorite to write about or research? Do you have a favorite person? Well, I mean, I can't truly choose a favorite. Um, I loved all these people. And if I included them, you know, I really think they're uh, an admirable hero. Uh, and so there are, you know, 60 plus people between that I chose to include. And, um, but I will say I really connected with Eleanor Roosevelt when researching her. Uh, she is in Queer There and Everywhere, but not Rainbow Revolutionaries. And um, we named our first daughter, Eleanor, after her. Um, so I was pregnant while writing Queer There and Everywhere. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt just had this quiet, strong leadership that I really admired, um, achieved so much, but in an almost subtle, way and um yeah I but another person who is in both books is Sylvia Rivera who was a woman who had a really different leadership style that was anything but quiet and just so fearlessly outspoken and so I'm more of an Eleanor but sometimes I wish I was more of a Sylvia because Sylvia was just has this like doesn't care confidence. And um, so it's just kind of, yeah, um, I really, really admire both of those women. Was Sylvia also at Stonewall? Yes, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera uh, were best friends who worked together um, there's actually some debate about whether Sylvia was actually at Stonewall, but um, popular opinion and legend has decided that she was. And uh, they, they're considered to be the two who not only led the riots, but, um, you know, they, they worked for trans 
rights and trans survival in New York City. Um, and yeah, they, they were, the two of them together were really important activists um, in that area and are both remembered fondly um, today. All right, so we have a question from Megan. Do you feel as though children are more comfortable with the LGBTQ community because they haven't been tainted by societal standards? I noticed when I was teaching my students in foster care um, about Pride Month last week, they were all very easily accepting, even though a lot hadn't ever really been exposed to the LGBTQ plus uh, LGBTQ community personally. Uh, I do, I, I agree. I think children, they do accept kind of whatever their, the circumstances that they're given or what, um, what they're told is what's normal um, for them. And so if the first thing they hear about LGBTQ people is that they're normal, then it'll be normal to them. Um, and yeah, you see that a lot from little kids just like oh okay when they're not like surprised or traumatized or anything they just are like uh they're like oh are you a girl or a boy um and somebody might answer like oh I'm both oh okay like it's not they never heard otherwise so um I think if they haven't heard at home, this is like a terrible sin and a teacher can reach them first, um, all the better. Let's see, that's the only question I am seeing. Um, please move any more questions for Sarah, go ahead and get those in the Q&A box. Um, we did have a comment um, one of our attendees is so thankful for your presentation and what they learned about these six people. Um, so please, yes, we are so grateful to have Sarah here with us tonight. We've been planning this talk, I feel like, for so long. I'm, I can't believe it's uh, here. <laughs> I, know. I know, we're like, oh, actually, I, yeah, I mean, it shows how long ago it was that we planned it as an in-person event. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> decided to go online, um, you know, a different world in a matter of months. Um, so I, uh, both of these books are both hardcover, well, Queer There and Everywhere is a paperback now, but they're both hard copy and ebooks. And then Rainbow Revolutionaries is also an audiobook. Uh, so that's super cool. And if you would like to purchase um, either of the books, um, you know, maybe after checking it out through the library or instead of however you want to do it, um, they are available at the library. But uh, Book Club on the Go is the one is the bookstore in Connecticut that I'm using for signed copies. So um, if you order through her, then um, I can personalize a signing to you and mail a little book plate label that she'll put in the book for you before she sends it. So um, I put those links in the Facebook event. Um, all right, there are two questions now. Should we take Grace, um, do you think yes. queer history really will? Do you think queer history will become more prominent in school textbooks? If so, when? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, in Massachusetts, two years ago, it was added to the public um, curriculum, actually. Uh, but it's uh, any school can opt out of using it. Um, over the last few years, ten states not including Massachusetts, have um, passed laws that mandate teaching queer history in schools, which, um, or public schools, uh, which is pretty amazing, um, but it's not a step Massachusetts has taken, even though 
they have put queer history into school curriculums. Um, the textbooks, it's probably going to be supplemental, um, like mine, because textbooks are take even longer. Um, that's a whole other publishing world. Um, doesn't mean that teachers can't assign, uh, you know, reading from something like Queer There and Everywhere in um, if the textbook doesn't include something like Stonewall. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then another question, are these the first two books you have written or do you have more, any plans for more books? These are the first two books I have written. Although I did put out a self-published ebook about vegan weddings years ago. Uh, <laughs> um, and I wrote a few books in elementary school because they had these little make your own book kits um, where you could sew up the binding. Um, but yeah, these are, they're both with HarperCollins. Uh, I don't have, these are my only two right now, but I'm in talks about a picture book right now. Um, and I wouldn't rule out a book for adults either. Um, I definitely have more plans for more books. Uh, and if you want to hear about those, you can stay in touch on social. Um, and if anyone was too shy to ask a question or thinks of something later, you can contact me through my website too. Excellent. I think that answered all of the questions that we um, received in the chat or the Q&A. Um, Sarah, are there any uh, closing, closing thoughts for us tonight? I know that you have just presented. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thank you all for your thoughtful participation and to the Wilmington Memorial Library for inviting me. Um, I'm so glad this could still work out um, through current conditions. Um, I hope that everybody um, just, I, I keep these, these heroes with me um, all the time. Um, and I, I hope if you connect, if you find someone from history to connect with, um, you know, you can learn from them. Think of, you know, like what would Harvey do or something <laughs> like that. Um, it, it helps me. I hope it helps you. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much for having me and happy pride to everybody. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. I, uh, I think we'll end there. Um, thank you so much for everyone who joined us uh, through Zoom. And we had quite a few people on Facebook Live. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and cut the Facebook Live feed.